The most popular video game right now is Fortnite, which earns over $100 million in revenue each month. The best selling video game of all time is Minecraft, with over 170 million copies sold and counting. The fastest selling video game of all time is Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto V, which sold over 12 million copies in less than a day. And the first commercially successful video game that jump-started the video game industry was Atari's Pong, released back in 1972. But what was the first video game? We're all familiar with iconic games like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Super Mario Bros., Sonic the Hedgehog, and countless others that revolutionized video games and how we play them. But today, I'm going to tell a story none of you have heard before. And that is the story of the world's first video game. I think the most underrated country in the world is Canada. Despite the abundance of jokes about Canadians' alleged inferior intelligence and that their only claim to fame is being the United States' next-door neighbor, we actually have a lot to thank Canada for. Canada has, a, has contributed a lot more to the world than just maple syrup and ice hockey. We can also thank Canada for batteries, walkie-talkies, Alex Trebek, gas masks, garbage bags, Canada Dry, snowmobiles, poutine. Who doesn't love poutine? Oh, and to all you Golden State fans, I'm sorry to break it to you, but the Raptors winning the finals this year wasn't a fluke because guess what? Basketball? Yep, Canada invented that too. And you can add video games to that long list of Canadian accomplishments because in 1950, the world's first video game was invented by Rogers Majestic, a Canadian technology company based off Toronto. And if you're from Canada, the name Rogers should sound very familiar because the founder of Rogers Majestic, Ted Rogers Sr., was the father to Ted Rogers Jr., who founded Rogers Communications, the largest telecom company in Canada, which provides cable TV, internet, landline, and wireless phone services to Canada. Uh, Rogers in Canada is very similar to Verizon down in the States and Vodafone across the pond, though I've heard a lot of negative things from Canadians about Rogers and their quality of service. So if you're Canadian and you're watching this video, let me know how good or bad Rogers actually is because I have no idea. But that's the Rogers that most Canadians would be familiar with today. But the Rogers dynasty did not begin with landline phones or, or cable TV. It began with the radio. More specifically, the vacuum tubes that were used in order to power radios. See, back in the 20s, while radio was becoming more and more popular, there was one thing holding it back from becoming mainstream, and that was cost. Although the radios themselves weren't really that expensive, the batteries required to operate them were. You see, these batteries were necessary because they had the high voltage needed to power the vacuum tubes for the radio, while the alternating current of home electricity was too weak to power the vacuum tubes used in early radios. And considering that these batteries had to be replaced every so often, yeah, it could get really expensive to own a radio over time, so most people decided not to. That quickly changed after Ted Rogers Sr. invented the AC-powered radio in 1925. Now you could plug a radio into an outlet and use your home's electricity instead of those expensive batteries. Now, this was a huge technological milestone, which Rogers accomplished by developing a new vacuum tube that was able to run on the lower voltage of AC power, reducing power consumption and saving costs for the consumer. Now, the AC powered radio helped skyrocket the popularity of radios throughout the late 20s. And in order to truly capitalize on the demand for Rogers vacuum tubes, Rogers began to prioritize the development and manufacturing of vacuum tubes over the sale of actual radio sets. After Ted Rogers died in 1939, his brother Joseph became the new head of Rogers Majestic and soon sold the company to Philips. As a division of Philips, Rogers continued to manufacture radio sets and radio vacuum tubes, and in 1949, as the radio began to lose relevance, the company started manufacturing TV sets. And not to mention that TV sets also used vacuum tubes, which were the Rogers specialties. So 
seemed like a sensible and foolproof business strategy to, to capitalize on the newfound success and popularity of the television and the television industry. But the move didn't actually do much to maintain the company's growth, as Canadian consumers just weren't interested in buying TV sets from Rogers and went to other manufacturers instead. So the company had to look beyond the radio or the television in order to stay relevant. They needed to start thinking outside the box, and instead of looking at the past or the present, they needed to look into the future. And in the late 1940s, computers were the future. Machines capable of reading and storing massive amounts of data, and artificial intelligence capable of solving the most complex problems and equations in a matter of seconds that humans have struggled to solve for years. And computers were an exciting new technology with incredible potential, and Rogers wanted to get in on the ground floor. One of Rogers' top engineers at the time was a graduate student at the University of Toronto by the name of Joseph Cates. Cates started working for Rogers in 1944 when he was an undergraduate at U of T. Uh, during this time, Cates would assist Rogers in developing radio vacuum tubes. And during grad school, Cates continued to work for Rogers while also assisting the University of Toronto in developing the first Canadian computer known as the University of Toronto Electronic Computer, or UTEC. Early computers utilized vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are ideal for household appliances, radios, and televisions because they are meant to perform simple, specific tasks. Computers, as you can imagine, perform far more sophisticated tasks than any of those devices. So while most electronics only needed several vacuum tubes to, to operate, most early computers required tens of thousands of vacuum tubes in order to properly function. And this is why early computers required so much space, why they took up entire rooms, and why, why they were just so massive. And it's also why most universities opted against utilizing computing technology, as the operating costs were just too astronomical, not only to build the machine with all those vacuum tubes, but also the cost to maintain the operation of the machine. Just imagine what the electric bill would be with, with, with a device that massive and, and all those vacuum tubes. It's just, it, it would be, it's just too astronomical that most universities decided not to even consider uh, funding computer research and development. So obviously the University of Toronto was no exception. They encountered all these problems in developing the UTEC. So while working for Rogers, Cates developed his own proprietary vacuum tube, the Adatron tube, meant to remedy these problems. A single Adatron tube had the capability of 10 regular vacuum tubes, giving it the potential of drastically reducing the size and power consumption of computers. Cates' ultimate goal, of course, was to use this technology to assist the University of Toronto in developing the UTEC. And confident that this device would become the future of computing, Rogers tasked Cates into creating a machine that could demonstrate the Adatron tube's capabilities to potential buyers and investors, and to build it in time for the 1950 Canadian National Exhibition. Uh, the Canadian National Exhibition, or CNE, is an annual event that showcases and celebrates Canadian technological achievements. And the CNE is, of course, a highly publicized event with extensive media coverage, making it the perfect platform for Rogers to introduce the power of the Adatron tube to not only Canada, but the entire world. So it was essential to construct a device that could not only demonstrate the power of the Adatron tube, but could also appeal to a mainstream audience in order to receive that press coverage and attention. So Cates determined that a machine capable of playing tic-tac-toe with an advanced AI system would be able to check all those boxes. And in a 2014 interview with Spacing Toronto, Cates explains his decision to build a device running tic-tac-toe specifically. On the UTEC, we were actually playing games, so I said, look, we can build a game-playing machine. Practically everybody knows tic-tac-toe. I thought it would make a nice exhibit. Dubbed Birdie the Brain, it was capable of doing just that. Standing 13 feet or 4 meters tall, the device featured an advanced AI with adjustable difficulty along with a light bulb display to indicate the moves made by the player and the AI. The X represented the computer's move and the O represented the player's moves. The controls were pretty straightforward as well. A 9-button grid, 
laid out similarly to a tic-tac-toe board, each button representing the location in which the player makes their move on the main board. As far as gameplay is concerned, that's all. That's about all there is to it. It's a simple, straightforward game of tic-tac-toe on the surface, though the technology behind it is, of course, far more complex than the simple game it represents. Remember, this game was built almost 70 years ago, the same year the Korean War started. Harry Truman was President of the United States. World War II had just ended five years before, 20 years before Pong. So the fact that a video game was actually made that long ago on its own is mind-blowing. But not, not to mention that you're not just playing tic-tac-toe against your friend with a piece of paper and a pencil. You're, you're playing against an advanced AI system in 1950. Considering the laughably bad AI that a lot of modern games have, that is certainly a very impressive technological achievement. And the public certainly believes so, because Birdie the Brain quickly became the most visited exhibit in the entire CNE that year. Everyone wanted to try it beating the AI to prove that humans will never be conquered by robots. But nobody was able to beat the brain. People were getting so frustrated at getting their asses kicked Cates had to stand by near the machine to manually adjust the AI difficulty. Not just for children. Comedian Danny Kaye made a highly publicized appearance at the 1950 exhibition, and he couldn't beat the machine either. And this picture was taken after a finally won, with the difficulty settings, of course, being lowered significantly. Uh, unfortunately for Cates and Rogers Majestic, the Adatron 2 became irrelevant after Solid State became the technological standard in computer building. Devices with built-in circuitry and semiconducting transistors were far more practical than continuing with vacuum tubes. It, it, solid State made development costs much cheaper and were far more durable and reliable than vacuum tubes ever could be. And Cates believed that he would have become a billionaire if only the Solid State revolution took place 10 years later. but. There's no need to feel sorry for Cates, he went on to have a distinguished career in engineering, most notably inventing the world's first automated traffic system. So you can add traffic lights to that long list of Canadian accomplishments. Uh, unfortunately, Birdie the Brain was dismantled and disregarded not long after the exhibition ended. One of the most important pieces of video game history is sadly lost. In retrospect, it seems incomprehensible that such an innovative and popular machine was never thought to be preserved, but the thing is, Birdie the Brain was never intended to be a commercialized product, never mind the start of a multi-billion dollar gaming industry. Its only purpose was to provide a tech demo for the Adatron Tube to display its capabilities and showcase it. It achieved its purpose, so nobody saw any reason to preserve it, and considering that the technology used to build the machine quickly became relevant, it was quickly forgotten. Maybe Roger should have thought of maybe mass-producing Birdie the Brain and putting them in toy stores all over the place, maybe at a coin slot. Just imagine how different the video game landscape would be if they decided to go in that direction. Well, that's the story of the world's first video game. I hope you guys found it interesting. I know we kind of got into like vacuum tubes and, and Canadian history and all these different things. But it all comes together, and I, I believe the context is important into like what, not not just what the video game was, but why it was created, how it was created. I think all that's important because not too many people know the early history of video games from the 1950s to the 1970s. That that's like a lost period of video game history that not too many people are familiar with, which makes a lot of sense because again, these games, uh, and, and we're going to talk about more games in the future, but this game. Uh, especially, yeah, it's the first video game you think it would be a big deal, but it was publicly demonstrated for a couple weeks at an, at an expo, and then it was dismantled and soon forgotten. So it makes sense that this portion of video game history was, was long forgotten because these were mainly tech demos and they weren't really accessible to the public, so if only a handful of people got to experience it, naturally it's going to get lost over time. But I plan on doing more videos showcasing that early period of video game history from the, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Pretty much that entire era of video game history right before Pong. Because people view Pong as the beginning of video game history, essentially. 
So I want to shed more light on that early period that not too many people talk about. So that, that's what I plan on doing in the future. Let me know what you guys thought about this video, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.